You what? Okay. Okay. Um, good evening or good day, everybody. This is the eighth uh, session that Ramon I, and I are having on decolonial dialogues. And uh, we wanted to talk about the nation state in the last episode, but we ended up discussing uh, the strategy of the decolonial uh, organizations in Europe. But these sessions are also theoretical sessions. So we'll take up the issue of the nation state again and try to figure out what the decolonial view uh, of the nation state might be and what the political implications are of that decolonial view uh, on the nation state. So let me start first by uh, explaining the concept of the nation state. Um, in the regular dominant view. And uh, basically, during world histories, uh, we know there were many civilizations that had one or more states within that civilization. And the state then is defined by uh, administration of a geographical region. So you have a political administration, a state that administers, that governs a certain area. And then during history, most of those people living in those areas were often culturally diverse. So culturally diverse means people with different languages, different belief systems, different traditions, uh, uh, different norms and values. And in the course of human history, uh, people have been thinking about how to manage a state where you have different nations and the nation is then a population with this cultural uh, characteristics. And in the Western concept of science, people start thinking, especially white people start thinking, with the rise of science, which is in the second half of the 17th century, so two and a half century ago. And they thought that people outside the West they didn't have brains, they didn't think. They were acting irrational. That's why the term modernity is linked to the rise of science and to the idea that rational thinking is a specific European trait. So people who were not thinking rational, obviously were thinking irrational, emotional. But uh, looking at different uh, historical records of different civilizations, there were people thinking, there were thinkers, leaders, uh, thinking about how to set up a state and how to deal with this uh, complex diversities of cultures. Let me give you one example in the Islamic civilization. Uh, when uh, uh, the prophet and uh, the Islamic movement established their first state in Medina after they left uh, Mecca. Uh, they had to build a state with people with different belief systems, notably the Jews, but also, let's say, the non monotheistic religions, people. And they, they had to figure out how do you live with these people although you have proclaimed to be the dominant uh, 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 ideology of that state. So they set up a charter, the Medina Charter, in which they specifically proclaim the rights of Jews and other minorities. So saying that uh, you don't have to give up your religion. You could, you have the space uh, to uh, uh, believe uh, whatever you want. Uh, you have the space 
uh, to set up your uh, 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 temples and whatever you have. And that charter is basically a model for many civilizations. Uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, wrote a book of how the Chinese leaders should learn from Confucius and uh, classical philosophers of China. And in that book, he takes up the issue of building a state with diverse uh, nations, with many nations. And then he uses from the classical philosophers of China, he uses this phrase that you can't have music with just one tone. It is the diversity of tones that establish music in your ears. You can't, you can't have food with only one ingredient. It wouldn't taste. It's the different ingredients that makes uh, uh, the soup, he, has what he was talking basically about soup, delicious. So basically he argues that uh, managing the diversity is a crucial element in getting a healthy state. Now, they have problems in China in applying this, for example, to the Uyghur, you know, in how to deal with the Muslim minorities uh, but obviously, it's not just how to deal with the Muslim minority now, because in Chinese history, uh, Uyghurs have played import, an important role. For example, the, uh, the general uh, Shanghai, which before Columbus sailed Africa and the world, uh, uh, came from, from the Uyghurs. Uh, and there's a museum after him. It is the problem of how the Chinese dealt with terrorist acts that came out of the Muslim communities that they couldn't have and didn't have, you know, a correct, in my view, correct application of these classical philosophies that diversity strengthened your nations. Diversity is the key formula in, 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 in creating a good and healthy nations. So, Within the different uh, uh, philosophical systems uh, that were the underlying base of a civilization, the basic idea was that the nation state, they didn't obviously use that concept and the, those category, but the way to build a state with different nations is the concept of pluriversity, which the Bolivians put in the constitution. The Bolivians put in the constitution after Evo Morales took over that their, their state is a pluriversal state, meaning that uh, the state will acknowledge and respect the rights of the different nations, the different cultural groups, enable them to flourish in dignity and respect, and the concept of pluriversity then lies at the basis of a few on how to build a society based on different cultures. So my argument is decolonial theory doesn't have to invent something new in terms of how to deal with the nation state. There are already ideas there in previous civilizations and in general, my idea that decolonial theory is not just inventing things. It's also using what was already there in different civilizations, in political theory, in social theory, in economic theory, et cetera. So in, in this uh, question of political and cultural theory, the question of the nation state, we can go back to what has been thought in uh, Chinese and Islamic civilizations and people who are more first than I am in other civilizations could probably be come with examples uh, that put the same thought on the agenda that is you can build a nation 
in its pluriversity and strengthen that nation. It's not weakening that nation, it's strengthening it. Okay, now we come to Europe because before the 15th century, Europe was very backward. If you would compare Cordoba in Spain, which is in Europe, but under Muslim uh, uh, rule, with Paris or London, then London and Paris were just villages. You know, Cordoba had a library of what, 500,000 books and uh, uh, well-developed scientific uh, culture. And within the, the south of Spain, the Jews and Christians were protected on the Muslim road. <coughs> so you get now two developments in Europe that uh, puts the nation state as a state with one nation. So everybody living in that state should assimilate to become that nation, give up their own culture and take over the culture of um, the dominant uh, uh, nation. And the concept of nation states was developed from two directions. One is from theology. Um, and that is basically after the fall of Grenada, and which are wonderful videos, you know, uh, people should look at the videos of Ramon explaining the implications of the fall of Grenada for the rise of Christian civilization. And um, so the idea that everybody should be Christian when the Christians took over uh, on January the 1st, 1492 in Granada, they established the idea of a nation state based on Christianity. So if you are a Muslim or a Jew, you should hide your identity, you should be converted. So conversion was the instrument in forcing the establishment of a nation state based on one culture, Christianity, uh, one religion, that culture based on one religion. And the rise of uh, uh, the occupations of the Americas, uh, they, they, they transported that idea and uh, conversion and assimilation became then part of colonization. So what you see in the colonies, the colonized people were seen as inferior people. Uh, and, and, and in the case of uh, the enslaved, they were seen as cattle, which you can sell in the bookkeeping of the plantations. An indigenous slave or uh, African enslaved who was kidnapped from Africa was registered alongside the horses and the pigs, and they put out, I have so many Negroes. That was cattle for them, not human beings. So after the legal abolition of slavery in the Americas, uh, Blacks and indigenous were expected to assimilate the white restaurant culture, and specifically also Christianity, a lot of conversions. Uh, were, were taking place during colonialism. Uh, so establishing one nation based on one culture, although the people who have been subjugated by colonialism did not have this Western culture, became part of the colonial narrative. The nation state should be linked to colonialism in that sense. But that's not the case because often it is linked to the second dimension of the nation state, which came after the Treaty of Westphalian in 1684 in Europe, where the different states in Europe, and then we are talking already at the end of the uh, 17th century, uh, the 
enlightenment had already started in 1650. You know, you have the philosophers and the scientists uh, putting out uh, the idea that knowledge is created not from the Bible, but from observation and reasoning. Uh, so the rise of rationality, the rise of science, the rise of philosophy, uh, put forward the concept that the different uh, Catholics and Protestant states that were fighting each other, that they should respect in the peace that they have conducted, they should respect the sovereignty of nations. So the nation state comes now with a concept of sovereignty. <coughs> so each nation is sovereign. And that means that other nations should respect their sovereignty. But then the nation is also divided, defined by having one culture, one religion. Uh, uh, and in Europe and in, 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 in the westernized world, with the rise of the Enlightenment, the basis of modern nation became the concept of modernity. So modernity, with the rise of science, the separation of church and state, uh, which was never completely because many religious groups had different forms of influence uh, in Western Europe uh, and in, also in America. Uh, uh, basically, the nation state became a liberal state. So liberalism became the ideology of the nation state and every people, every person living in those modern states should adhere to the liberal philosophy. And now one has to understand that the identity of the West is linked to the concept of liberalism, the freedom of the individual, multi-party system, political system, uh, separation of powers, all these concepts of liberalism, which is at the heart of the European enlightenment, all these concepts a concept of liberalism, the economic system, market economy, private enterprises. And uh, uh, liberal philosophers like Fukuyama, after the fall of the Soviet bloc, proclaimed the end of history, meaning that this system of liberalism will be ultimately the system under which the whole of the world will govern and will, will, will live. And so the nation state will be a state where although you have different ethnic groups, eventually these ethnic groups will have to be modernized. So if you are a Muslim, sooner or later you have to go through the same process of uh, what Christians went through, which is from Christianity to atheism. So Muslims should acknowledge that the religion is backward, should leave the religion, become modern man, and uh, not believe in the uh, backwardness of, of religion. And uh, so embracing this ideology of liberalism uh, is basically the fundament of, um, of the nation state now in a modern world. Now the West, including the United States, but certainly in Europe. The United States is different because they have this multicultural society since they occupied the land of the indigenous people, introduced uh, enslaved Africans, imported them, kidnapped them, and uh, uh, it was there. But in Europe, only after uh, uh, World War II, basically uh, the European nations then got a large influx of uh, people from the former colonies uh, and established then this 
big communities in the big cities of Europe where they have maintained their culture, religion, language, etc., ideas. And this is now one of the crises of Western Europe is <coughs> because they are based on the concept of the nation state. They don't know how to create a new nation with respect for pluriversity. And if you don't respect that, at the end of the day, what you do is you have to suppress the expressions of people who disagree with the foundation of Western civilization. It could be the blacks, could be the Muslims, could be other people with indigenous roots. Uh, and now we see that in Western Europe, the inability to articulate a policy based on pluriversity, a decolonial policy, they are running into a lot of problems. Uh, they are creating tensions between the different ethnic groups, where the dominant group is oppressing the civil and human rights and political rights, uh, especially of the Muslims now. Uh, we see that all across of Europe, uh, recently with all the measures uh, Macron has taken and which you have gone uh, the, the previous lecture. And I think that the decolonial movement has a role to play here, to, to point out the failure of the concept of the nation state. And it's different, for example, in Spain, obviously they have a different history than in France where the nationalities in Spain are, are much more forceful in their identity. You know everything about that, Ramon. And um, so the policy of the decolonial uh, uh, activists should think about the nation state, look and point out to the failure <coughs> of the nation state as a policy uh, and assimilation, which many of them do, but point out to the concept of pluriversity, uh, which built a nation with, which built a state with different nations. That is uh, what I wanted to say for now. Yes, um, I mean, it's very interesting what you're saying. Uh, the concept of the nation state is really a serious problem. Uh, the concept of the nation state creates more problems than solutions. Uh, the main reason is that the nation state is a fiction. It doesn't exist anywhere. This pretension that there is a correspondence between the identity of the state and the identity of the population living under the borders of that state is a complete fiction. It, it doesn't work. I mean, the, all states in the world have a, a multicultural reality on the ground. That is, the identities are, there are many identities coexisting and many cultures coexisting <coughs> inside uh, states. So this pretension of having one state with one national identity that corresponds one-to-one -to, -one to the identity of the population is, is just a, a, a Eurocentric fiction. And Western civilization in its expansion and in its influence around the world have, in a sense, uh, exported this model to uh, the rest of the world. Um, and people in the, in, the, in the third world, people who have been the victims of Western domination have, in a sense, uh, assimilated this concept of nation state through the colonization of the mind. So you have also uh, the reproduction of this concept in countries that emancipated or liberated from colonialism then next day when they build a state, they reproduce the Eurocentric model of political authority and, and go back to the concept of a nation state. And, and so this is a, a, a serious problem of the world at large today, okay? Uh, this, we can trace the origins of this back in history. For example, when the, with the European colonial expansion, it began with the conquest of Al-Andalus, you know, the, that part of Islamic civilization yeah. in the south of the Iberian Peninsula, when the um, Castilian Christian monarchy conquer, conquered 
the, the south of the Iberian Peninsula uh, and destroy Islamic civilization and impose Christian civilization there, they impose the concept of uh, Christianize or I kill you. Everybody you have who stay in the territory were forced to conversion to Christianity. There you have the seeds of this concept of the nation state, uh, where you have this pretension of everybody under the rule of the uh, <clears throat> Castilian Christian monarchy have to be Christians. So uh, people who were Jews or Muslims in the process of conquest were forced to convert to Christianity in order, in order to not be killed or not be expelled and to be able to live in the territory even under a subordinated position inside that territory. So you have there uh, uh, the beginnings of this that later was secularized, especially with the French Revolution into the concept of the nation state, okay? But this began in Christendom, you know? It was a Christendom concept in the process of conquest to impose Christianity to everybody mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because in other civilizations that did not exist. Even in moments where the Muslims expanded to other territories, there was always a multicultural state there that recognized the different uh, religious belief and identities of the population living under the borders of the, of the, of the Islamic state. Uh, you know, back in, in, uh, <clears throat> in Islamic civilization, you know, uh, now, uh, pre-modern states, not only in Islamic civilization, but many other civilizations, pre-modern states, they were always multicultural. They were never nation states in this modern idea that comes from Christendom. You know, it's, uh, this idea, it was not there. It was always, uh, there was never that pretension. It was always recognized that that this, the people living inside the territory of that state were uh, uh, belong to different identities, spiritual beliefs, uh, different cultures, etc. So this is it's very important because we have this idea that in in you know before modernity, uh, there's nothing we can learn from things before modernity. Okay, mm -hmm. that there's nothing, and so these examples you're giving are very good because it shows possibilities that we have in the present and the future that are there in the past that we can grab on to update. Not that we're going back in history, but that's impossible, but at <clears> least <throat> there's some interesting ideas that we can work on to bring into the present and future, okay? In a context, of, of always contextualizing. We, never, we can never bring from the past in a mechanical way uh, processes of the past, but we can learn from some ideas of the past that could be useful for us to get out of this trap of the concept of nation state. And the second thing is that always what happened with this concept is that the people who do not fit the, the hegemonic definition of the state are people who, whose citizenship rights, whose access to state resources, whose access to uh, um, uh, concepts of equality or things like that are always in, in, in problems because uh, by not recognizing this diversity inside the territory, then there are hierarchies of domination that are in a sense established under the justification that some population are more equal than others, okay? Because their identity corresponds to the identity of the state. So you have inside a nation state populations who might be not citizen because they are migrants or because they are, they never got, even though they're living there for years or decades or even hundreds of years, they don't have citizenship. Or even if they have citizenship, mm -hmm. they are treated, treated as second class citizens. You know, so this is a, a problematic structure that we need to overcome, you know, and this is part a structure, this concept of nation is part of the structure of, uh, you know, modern uh, civilization today, of modernity that is spread all over the place, creating a lot of problems, more problems than solutions, you know, so uh, we need to overcome that. An example of 
in the in the modern in the, right now in the contemporary world we live today of alternative to this was is the the transformations proposed by indigenous movements in South America, especially in Ecuador and Bolivia, that they transform the constitution of these countries under the concept of plurinational states, which is a very interesting concept, which is breaking away from the nation state concept and is proposing a formal political authority that recognizes that there are different nations coexisting inside the borders of that state and therefore you need some kind of intercultural uh, relationship between these different nations okay to establish relations of equality that is equality has to be be redefined from the point of view of um, um, from the point of view of ju uh, justice and from the point of view of acknowledgement of the differences between the different cultures and nations coexisting inside the state. So one nation cannot impose on the other their concepts of identity, culture, democracy, etc. So this is a, a very interesting proposal that of course is coming from by indigenous movements in Latin America because They've been always the victims of the coloniality of power of the nation state. They've been always excluded from citizenship rights. They've been super exploited. They've been dominated. They've been dispossessed of resources by that state that in the case of Latin America is in a sense, a white Creole state uh, that dominates, you know, the descendants of the Spaniards and Portuguese colonizers are the ones now running those states in the name of the nation and then excluding anybody who do not belong to that identity you know so i'm saying this uh, because there there are proposals out there already happening that are decolonial <clears throat> and that we need we can go to the past to learn from the past but there are things happening today that we can learn from that are also useful for us to think about models of political authority that are going beyond this problematic concept of nation state. And look at the West today. Inside the West, <coughs> they don't know what to do because in fact, what they have is a system of white supremacy with the white people or the white elites running the show and everybody who do not fit their you know, a racial identity, racial and cultural identity, become inferior races inside that state. And this is happening in the West, in the geographic West, but it's happening everywhere else in the world today because of this problematic structure of the nation state, okay? So we need to decolonize it. And one example is not the only one, but it could be useful to think about it, is the concept of plurinational state proposed by indigenous movement in Latin America, uh, especially Ecuador and Bolivia, and they changed the constitution. Now the struggle is in Bolivia and Ecuador today is uh, how to implement this constitution because of course the white elites of the right and the left resist the implementation of what is said in those constitutions, which is funny because these constitutions became very important in terms of transforming the old constitutional nation state into a plurinational state. And those constitutions were approved. And now there is a struggle about what does that mean? Because now there are people, you know, non-indigenous populations, especially the, the, from white backgrounds in those countries, trying to, re, to, to transform the meanings and the content of, of what is said in those constitutions. And also that's part of the struggle today. But at least there is a change of the constitution that acknowledge the, that the state's plurinational. And that's in Bolivia and Ecuador. Now, at, at least in Bolivia, <clears throat> the, the movement who was in power and defeated by coup d'etat came back to power recently in the Keynes of Ecuador that hasn't happened. We have not right now uh, in power neoliberal pro-imperialist 
government that, of course, ignores completely the constitution, the plurinational constitution of the country. Uh, now, the second point that I wanted to develop in terms of the concept of nation state is the concept of state. What to do from the colonial point of view with the state, okay? We know very well that in most of the world, we <clears throat> move from colonialism to neocolonialism. That means that the newly formed independent states are really formally independent, but in reality, they are not independent. In reality, they are still controlled by the imperialist powers, by the old colonial rulers, but now indirectly with new forms of colonialism. This is the concept that Kwame Krumah coined, uh, the leader of Pan-Africanist movement in, La in Africa, uh, the concept of neo-colonialism, new forms of colonialism going on today. And so we know very well that the spaces of sovereignty of those states are very limited, that they don't have the power, resources, or the space of maneuver in the world economy and the, <clears throat> the, the world politics today to be able to, in a sense, have a, a different, uh, different policies more in tune with the interests of their own people. They're basically right now uh, in most of the world ruled by westernized elites who are in a sense working for the dominant all imperial uh, metropolitan imperialist centers you know and so and then in those countries who did a revolution or a transformation that defeated the westernized elites in those countries and tried to do something different then the global system organizes to do a boycott or sanctions or economic blockade or even military aggression to destroy these regimes. For example, in the, the case of Venezuela, the case of uh, Cuba, the case of uh, Iran, the case Something. Oh, um. <clears throat> okay. We um, we're losing Ramon now. Uh, let let me. Of I'm sorry. Is this. Yeah. Some something went wrong and and um, okay. Move on, Ramon. Okay. It, it was. Okay, uh, well, okay, basically what I want to say, or what I was trying to say, I don't know if it was uh, recorded, but uh, I was talking about another aspect, which is the aspect of how neocolonial states are controlled, okay, by Western powers today, and, and how the space of sovereignty is limited, and how countries who manage to defeat the, the westernized elites controlling the states and try to take a more sovereign route, a more self-determination for the people and to work for the interests of their own people and not for the interests of imperialist transnational corporation or imperialist states, they're usually suffering economic blockade, military aggression, and so on. So these, uh, these military uh, aggressions affect their, their development. This is an example of Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, and many other countries today uh, that brought with imperialist uh, rulers and, and neo-colonial elites. And now they're trying to build something different. And, and they being, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, suffer from economic and military aggression. So the question is, what to do with the state? Not only how to decolonize, uh, the concept of nation state to move into other types of forms of political authority that we have discussed, but also what to do with state. Decolonial movements in general try, tend to take a, a more anarchistic view and try to be anti-state because the state being a structure of modernity has always been a problematic structure that, that <clears throat> anti-imperialist movement, but even the colonial movement has inherited. You know, and so it has structures uh, that are, uh, have been organized along the lines of 
elites deciding for the people, right? Or elites deciding for their own interests against the people. And to move into a decolonial, transmodern, beyond modernity state, we need to think of form of political authority that are more uh, related to direct democracy, to communal forms of democracy and so on. But that's not in the agenda tonight. This is a long process, okay? So the tendency of some uh, decolonial movements is to take an anti-state position in the sense that, okay, we're not going to deal with the state. We're going to be opposed to the state. We're not going to, to, to intervene or try to enter the structures of the state. We're going to be always outside fighting that state, right? Now, this is a very problematic uh, situation because by trying to be purist, okay, and trying to not get any resource or not have anything to do with the state, the reality is that the state is there with repressive institutions, with repressive military organization, with uh, structures of, you know, of decision making, you know, that you cannot ju just ignore, it's there. So uh, by trying to be purists, you end up in a sense, uh, developing a type of politics that is, ends up being, uh, uh, leading you to, to marginality mm -hmm. because uh, in a sense, a lot of things pass through the debates inside the state and decision making inside the state. And if nobody's there calling attention to, to the struggles, to struggle inside the institutions, okay, then what happened many times that the right wing occupy the state and then they decide for everybody on their own agenda, who happened to be an agenda against the people, you know? And so, uh, and I'm saying this also in relation to the discussion last week of the colonial, uh, of the colonial movements inside Europe that have, a, and you know, this purist view of not getting resources and not having anything to do with the state. And in the end, you end up being hyper isolated. This is one lesson that we need to learn also from mistakes, I would say, of the peer, Partides Indigenes de la Republic in France. They took this line of being absolutist, anti-state, not having anything to do with the state. And in doing that, it, it basically put them in a very, very tough and difficult position in relation to their own population, their own um, you know, mass of followers, as well as in relation to the society at large in France. Uh, and they became very marginal, you know? Uh, and, and in many ways, irrelevant in many public discussions because they were not part of those debates, you see? So I would say I learned a lot from the experience of Venezuela and the conceptions of Hugo Chavez, okay? Uh, I'm not saying this has to be the model everywhere, okay? But I would say we need to look seriously at this experience because Hugo Chavez, contrary to what many people believe about Hugo Chavez because the propaganda of imperialism about Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, and the Bolivarian Revolution has been awful. So many people doesn't know well what <clears throat> is that about because all they know is the lies that you read in the media, you know? Uh, but taking that aside, the reality is that the, the political view of Hugo Chavez was we need to occupy that modern state that we have inherited from colonial and neocolonial past. We need to occupy it to interrupt the neoliberal policies and all the policies of domination. We get there, we, we take the right wing out of the structures, we take over the state, you know, and then we try to put policies forward that are beneficial for the people. But at the same time, we need to break <clears throat> from the old debate of the left, which was either you were, <clears throat> the solutions are all coming from the state and you were a socialist, statist socialism where you take the state as the solution to everything, 
or from the opposite to that, which was, we are anarchists, we don't deal with the state, the state is a problem, we need to destroy it tonight, okay? And we don't deal with it, you know? So this dualism in the left movement worldwide uh, <clears throat> was very problematic. And what Hugo Chavez did was to break away from this dualism and provide a way out of it by showing the possibility of occupying the state without the illusion that from that state you're going to get solution with the capital S. And that in the meantime, you're going from the state to empower the people outside the state to produce commune-like forms of political and economic structures <clears throat> that will in the long run, not tonight, but that's impossible to do overnight or in a short-term period, but in a long-term process, will be replacing the state in the decision-making of over, over, overall uh, issues of the Venezuelan society, okay? So we put emphasis there on the commune forms of political authority, create parallel to the actual state, a, a political structure called the com popular communes that will deal not only with economic affairs but also with political affairs and they put forward a parliament of communes parallel to a representative democracy liberal democracy parliament so they they are working in the two levels and the horizon in the long run is the commune so he is in the that's only possible if you have control over the state of the modern state. If you don't control it, it will happen to you like it happened in Colombia. You know, you try to organize a commune in anywhere in Colombia, urban or countryside, and the question is not going to be how long the commune will last. The question is going to be how long the humans in that commune will be alive because they will most probably be killed by paramilitary and military apparatus of the state, you know? So how do you create communes if you don't control this, the modern state, if you don't occupy? So you need to see the, the modern state as a place you are going to occupy, to interrupt the policies of domination, to be able then to build structures, new structures, or the future structures of a future form of political authority outside that state. You know, and so this strategy, I found it very useful to break away from the dualisms that characterizes the left between the state socialist and the anarchists, you know, which is a false debate. Here you see clearly how in, in the experience of Venezuela and the uh, political thought of Hugo Chavez, this thing is broke away, you know, this, this dualistic idea of the left. And I'm saying this because in a sense, in, in the case of the discussion last week about decolonial movements in, in, in Europe today or in the USA, for example, there has to be some kind of movement there. And you were mentioning the experience of DENK, uh, this, uh, this party of people of color, especially Muslims in, in uh, the Netherlands and how politically uh, uh, interesting they've been by just occupying parliament seats and then be part of the national debate and then be part of a, you know a bringing a complete different vision to the to the dutch society you know so these kind of strategies i think we need to think about them carefully right now the mass of people have illusions in democratic elections okay and this was a discussion that Lenin had, uh, you know, in the, in the, <clears throat> during his lifetime, where what to do with the uh, uh, parliamentary democracy. Are we going to boycott them because they are bourgeois? Or are we going to intervene there somewhere or another to denounce it, to occupy it and, and denounce it and create a different consciousness among the working class? He was looking at it from class. But we can look at it from more angles, not just class, but also race, gender, other issues. And I think that his solution was 
while the people of the masses of people are still having illusions in that structure, we need to consider seriously participating of these parliamentary processes in order to be like a, a Achilles heel, you know, the Achilles heel, you know, being the, or the Trojan horse, okay? Being the Trojan horse, where you enter there and you form part of the debate, people are paying attention to what happened there because they have illusions in it, and you create, you, you show the limits of those structures, you show them how those structures are not working for them, and how we need to move forward to other types of structures and create there a different consciousness that could be not just socialist in the case of Lenin, but could be also decolonial, you know, in terms of questions of race, instead of question of civilizational questions about modernity and the problems it creates and so on, you know, so, so this is something that I will have, I will see more as term of, in terms of tactics rather than strategy, you see, because if you put it as a principle, we need, we need to see a stack and not so much a strategy or, or, or questions of principle. If you take as a question of principle, never intervening at all inside the state, then you become an anarchist and then you become irrelevant in terms of social transformation, okay? And, but the other danger is to enter those institutions, be swallowed by them, and then not having a horizon, where are you going with that? Which is the danger of social democracy which they enter there and they just become part of the system. So these are the two dangers. And, but we need to, as the colonial movement, we need to work there in a fine line between these two extremes, the string of anarchism or the string of statism where you get swallowed by the system or by the structure of the state. And this is where that fine line requires both interventions inside those institutions as well as intervention outside those institutions. Any work you do inside the state has to be accompanied and supplemented and supported by struggles in the streets. It cannot be separated. It has to be the two together. And this is a, an issue that Lenin himself mentioned, the need to put the question of participating in liberal parliamentary uh, institutions have to be uh, tied with the struggles and uh, going on in the streets outside the parliamentary and the state institutions. So, so this is where I think the decolonial movement can learn mm. from those lessons of both the, uh, the, uh, the communist movement of the 20th century. One of the things we can learn from them is this flexibility in tactics and learn also from uh, the Hugo Chavez that I would say Hugo Chavez different from Lenin has a decolonial thinking because Hugo Chavez is fighting a modern neo-colonial state. It's moving towards a decolonizing of the society and it's bringing there a way out of this binary of destroying the state completely or, or or just being swallowed by the state, you see? Yes. And, and instead he was showing a way out mm -hmm. where you, you have to occupy the state to interrupt mm -hmm. the police of domination at the same time that you're supporting a, a solution that goes through, that happens outside the state. So yeah. anyway, this, this is my, these are my thoughts. Okay, thank you. I think for the next episode, we will build on this discussion because now what we did is analyze the concept of the nation state. And through that analysis, we discuss the problematic side of the nation state, the alternative in the concept of plurinationality, uh, and then came to the question of the state, the state itself, which you expanded on. And this is related to the question of strategy and tactics for social change. What, what is it that decolonial movements are, are fighting for? A revolution, a reform, uh, 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 what is it that we want? So I suggest the next session we build on this and go 
into like when Lenin wrote State and Revolution, he discussed this problem, you know, what, how does a state, how is a state being transformed by a revolution? And what is the state itself? So let's take it up for the next uh, meeting, it's very important. And um, uh, we'll, we'll develop the decolonial theory of state and revolution now. Thank you for okay. this, Ramon. All the best. Thank you, Zeus. Okay. Take care. Bye.